brood of vipers. I mean, this is to the people who think I'm okay. I, you know, I'm not like the rest of these sinners here. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. In other words, don't try and tell me about your religious heritage or how you've always belonged. He says, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. He says, the axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Which, by the way, just so you know this, I mean, this is famously called John's fire sermon. I mean, this is kind of his slap on the pulpit, hellfire and brimstone montage. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He'll clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Hello. I mean, <laughs> they kind of come out to see what's going on and they get this finger pointed right at him. You're the worst to the people that think, I'm all right. You're the absolute worst and don't you realize that the axe is already at the root of the tree. In other words, that axe has come all the way down and you are about to be cut off and thrown into the fire. Which, you know, if you came in here today thinking to yourself, oh, well, you know, I'm all right. I mean, this message should probably be waking you up right now. That axe already swung all the way down and you are about to be cut off and thrown into the fire. You are in the worst possible place when it comes to Jesus. This is this, is this big, huge message, and there's a reason for it. I mean, you'll hear about it as we start reading through the Gospels. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. And until you're at a point, and this is where John comes in, until you get to the point where you realize, like, whoa, I'm in trouble. I need help. There's nothing that Jesus can do for you. I mean, if you think you're okay, that, hey, me and God are fine. And that's why I think every time you hear about Jesus, John is told. Until you get this, that, that until you acknowledge that you are broken, sinful, hurting, Jesus won't mean anything to you. And uh, just, I mean, to kind of put this out there, there are, of course, some people who say, you know, today, this is kind of modern times, we should talk about God's love and not mention hell or fire. There are some people who say, listen, it's just totally illegitimate to say that hell fire should be a motive for Christian preaching or that, you know, sermons should exclude the idea of fear or frightening people. Um, you know, I hope you're a little frightened today, to be honest. I really do, because if you're not, then you're not ready to hear about Jesus. As though John, I think he just sharpens who Jesus is. You've got to be in this place where you realize you're a sinner until you know you need a Savior. Um, I'd like to have you turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. There's a passage there that I want to spend some time looking at. I'm kind of hoping that the next few minutes will be really, really uncomfortable. That you'll almost just squirm in your seat a little bit. If you do, I'll say yes. If, uh, if you kind of walk out of here today, say, oh, I'm fine. All that talk about sin and the axe being at the root of the tree and fire, that's a little melodramatic. Then I'll just, man, I'll feel like I... I didn't accomplish my purpose. So I hope in the next few minutes here, you just squirm in your seats a little bit. I want to begin reading at verse 19. There's a list of sins there. This is sometimes called a vice list. And it's kind of a moment to just get honest for yourself. Don't worry about the person next to you, just for yourself. This is what 
Paul's writing as he thinks about all of this. He says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Then he starts listing them. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. Sexual immorality is a word which, you know, the Greek word really means sex outside of the bonds of marriage, sexual activity outside the bonds of marriage. It's like taking the whole of someone while only giving to them a part. And, um, you know, included in this, I think especially in today's context, maybe we'd talk about things like pornography. Sexual activity outside of where God intended it to be in marriage. You know, this whole chapter, if you look at Galatians chapter 5, is about freedom in Christ. And um, for some of us, this great gift of sexuality has just enslaved us in one way or another. And when you're a slave to something, you're not free. God has something better intended for each one of us. The word debauchery really has to do with kind of your intentions where when you come close to that thing, you just cannot refrain. And there may be some of us, for instance, when we just get too close to this topic, we just cannot not fall in. And that's not freedom. That's not what Christ wants. And instead of just stuffing that in and keeping it to yourself, uh, the Christian practice is to get it out. Verse 20, idolatry and witchcraft. Idolatry is having or maybe even inventing something that you either place above or alongside of God. It could be anything. It could be a relationship. It could have four wheels. It could be money. It could be a job. Anything that has just become more important than our relationship with God or we just place on equal importance we fall into the sin of idolatry. And if in your relationship with God that's happened, you need to confess it and get it out. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, 